So good afternoon and welcome and uh, happy new year. First of all, first of all, welcome. Welcome to the authors of the 10 issues to watch. It's the seventh edition of the 10 issues to watch, but last year and the year before it was purely online. So when I say welcome, it's welcome to our beautiful reading room in the library uh, and uh, in the Spinelli building. So we have today the best of two worlds. We have you in the room and we have also uh, people connected online uh, on web stream. And I uh, greet also the colleagues and friends that are online. Happy New Year also, because it's still the first half of uh, January. 2022 has not been easy. Uh, we think, of course, about the war that was launched by Russia against Ukraine, the war on the European continent. We think about the consequences of COVID. But uh, now it's the beginning of a new year, and the beginning of the new year is a chance to think about the future, to look forward. And that is what we are going to do with the 10 issues to watch, to try to anticipate the year ahead, what is going to matter in the months to come in 2023. Today, the 10 authors will briefly present the selection of 10 issues. But it's going to be just a flavor of the publication that uh, I already encourage you to read if you have not done so. It's available at the entrance of the room and it's of course also available online. The 10 issues to watch are the result of a collective thinking in the members' research service. You will recognize issues that everyone is expecting. I was mentioning the war, but you will also be surprised by issues that are less uh, maybe in the spotlight, but that we consider that they could become important in the year to come. Of course, it's a choice. It's a subjective choice. But as director of the MRS of the members' research service, I believe that this work on Think tanking is essential about our ability to question possible futures and to do so in a collective exercise as a group. So the 10 issues that uh, we consider important in the year to come and 10 issues to watch, Russia Kovadis, budgeting in the times of war and crisis, EU recovery instrument lessons for public investment, the Janus faced fiscal monetary policy mix, how will increased food prices impact transport, climate and socio-economic tipping points, geoeconomics in an age of empires, and what is the risk for Africa, cyber resilience in the EU, protecting media freedom and journalists, and then finishing by the European elections 2024, heading towards these European elections. But before going to the presentations by the authors, I would like to hear, we would like to hear the message of Otmar Karas, first Vice President of the European Parliament, who among many responsibility is also in charge of parliamentary research. Mr. Karas is on trip today, so he cannot be with us, and it's a pre-recorded message. Over to you, Vice President. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, meine Damen und Herren, Liebe Freundinnen und Freunde, Cher Etienne, welcome to this event to launch the new year. Welcome to the seventh edition of the Research Services annual 10 Issues to Watch event. An event so fitting to start the year and guide our attention to a selection of key issues. This is the fourth time that I have had the pleasure to open this event. And every year, I look forward to this selection of 10 issues to discover what the members' research service under the leadership of Etienne Basso has cooked up for us all. Before we listen to the 10 presentations, let me say how much I wish I could have greeted you in person, especially when it is the season for exchanging our best wishes for the new year. I would have liked to be there in person to congratulate Etienne and the policy analysts for this publication, because nothing beats the direct contacts and conversations that we can have when we meet in the same room. 
that's probably one of the biggest lessons we learned over the last years from the COVID days. We have realized how important it is to discuss with our colleagues, especially our fellow members of parliament, when we could meet only on a screen. Indeed, what is parliamentary work? It is discussing ideas. It is confronting projects. This is at the heart of parliamentary work. And there is no better way to do it than meeting in person. Even more important this past year, we Europeans have realized how much we cherish peace with war returning to our continent last February. And this past month, we have realized how much we cherish parliamentary democracy when trust has been broken because of corruption. Among the fundamental values of the European Union are democracy, the rule of law, and justice. Our institutions promote these values, and the first institution in our treaties, the European Parliament, wants to lead the way. This is why we detest corruption, and this is why we need to modernize our parliamentary democracy. I know many of you attend this event every year. So, you may well remember that last year I spoke of the importance of dialogue. To restore a broken society, dialogue. To overcome division, dialogue. To reconcile opposing views, dialogue. This year, looking at the challenges ahead of us, I would insist again on one word. One word without which dialogue is not possible. One word without which democracy is not possible. One word without which peace is not possible. This word is trust. For each of us, trust in our loved ones, family members, friends, colleagues, and neighbors, you name it. Trust is the foundation of all aspects of our everyday life. For a country, trust in its neighbors. Trust that they will respect the treaties that they have signed and ratified. For citizens, trust in their representatives, the members of parliament they elect. Trust that they will decide guided solely by values and those fullness. In the past year, this trust was damaged. But this is not the end of the story. In each difficulty lies the possibility to grow, to improve. The European Parliament has already announced that this is planning a series of measures to address the loopholes that made this breach of trust possible. Let us make the most of every day of this new year to build trust, rebuild trust, strengthen trust. Let us work to strengthen our European democracy as an anchor of peace and prosperity on the continent. This is a task for every day, and it means understanding the world we live in. So, over to you, Etienne, to guide us through 10 issues to watch this year. Thank you. Merci. Vielen Dank.
thank you, thank you very much, Vice President, for the encouraging uh, words. Um, let us move now to uh, the presentations. The authors will present uh, their research, either from the podium or from this red bench there, where I will have a short conversation with them. And I will already ask them to keep the time. Uh, the pres presentations today are meant to give an appetite for more, an appetite for reading the 10 issues to watch. So let us start with Anna Caprile, who is from our External Policies Unit. Um, Anna has been writing on Russia Kovadis, and this is the first issue today that is not surprisingly about the war that was started on our continent. Um, the war that uh, uh, Russia started is shaping a transformation in Russia itself, our neighbor, so we should observe carefully also that aspect. Anna, you tell us more about how you see these internal developments happening in Russia and in the medium term. Over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Etienne, and good afternoon, everybody. The 24th of February, 2022, was a Thursday, like today. The images of that day will remain impressed, at least in my memory, as a 9-11 moment. The unthinkable had happened, and the world was about to change. As the year begins, all eyes will be of course, on the battlefield, where different military scenarios are at sight, and consequential decisions for all parties. <coughs> the paper Russia Kuovadis looks beyond the trenches, beyond the battlefield, at the country that will emerge from that war. And no matter how the conflict evolves, it appears that the path Russia has set to itself is already dramatically clear. It will emerge weaker, economically, militarily, and geopolitically weaker. The paper briefly describes how sanctions, uh, the war effort, and uh, increasing regional and international isolation are shaping the new Russia. Weaker, maybe, but not less dangerous for its own citizens, and for the rest of us. The Kremlin is now entangled in a self-made existential fight. A narrative is trying to impose or to uh, convey to its 156 citizens. The immobility of Vladimir Putin until 2036 looks shaky or at least less sure than before. And speculations about post-Putin scenarios are mounting. Beyond the gambles of who will be the next Russian Tsar, the paper very briefly examines possible uh, scenarios for the future of Russia. Under the first scenario, Putin's regime evolves into a boosted version of itself, over-centralized, over-authoritarian, semi-totalitarian regime, maybe full totalitarian already. This is happening already now and quickly. Russia is turning into a gigantic North Korea, as the New York Times very graphically put it. Such regimes, however, perform badly when mountain crises uh, lie ahead and multiple. This could lead to a second scenario, a slow, or not that slow meltdown of the regime. After this, many possibilities are open, and the most likely ones are not positive. A truly transformation towards democratization in Russia looks far away. As we speak, one of the most known leader of the Russian opposition, Alexei Navalny and Saharov laureate, languishes in a high-security prison in Moscow, 200 kilometers from Moscow. Already 450 doctors have signed a petition for urgent medical care. Let me finish with a final thought. Some analysts see in Russia the next failed state. Whatever happens, it looks at least 
will emerge like a failed empire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for this presentation. I forgot to say that you have been working uh, 15 years on uh, the issue of Russia and Ukraine, and you have been yourself uh, living in Kiev and Moscow uh, previously. Um, let's move now to the second subject, which is more about the EU response and how the EU shaped this response. And I'd like to focus on the budget. And uh, I'd like to ask Alina Dobreva, who is a policy analyst in our budgetary policies unit, to look at how the budget instrument in the European Union can be response uh, in times of war, but more generally in times of crisis. Over to you, Alina. So the general question is, is the EU financially ready for crisis responses? And unfortunately, the short answer is not entirely. And in 2023, we should be watching very closely if this readiness will improve and how it will improve. There are two aspects of the readiness. One is popular and pops up in everybody's mind. Do we have enough money? And the other one is what is the flexibility with which we can spend the money? And I'll start with the second one. So. The EU budget is an investment budget, not a crisis response budget. It is designed for stability and predictability, not for flexibility. It, is, um, it takes two to three years to negotiate the multi-annual financial framework between the Council, the Parliament, and initially uh, from the Commission. After that, this framework lasts for seven years. So it is seven years under which the uh, EU budget operates within a very rigid, very firm framework. That means that in 2020, for example, just after COVID, the EU policymakers had to deal with the budget that was initially designed around 2010, 2011. That's long before COVID crisis, long before migration crisis. It was during the Euro crisis, which you probably already forgotten about. So that's how relevant or irrelevant the EU budget could be to respond to crisis. But what can we do with this framework? Can we change it? Yes. There is an instrument called the midterm review. And the Commission has committed that in 2023, it will conduct a midterm review of the current multiannual financial framework. We need to be watching very closely how far this review will go and if it will be followed up by a proper revision or proper adaptation of the current MFF to the circumstances and needs and crisis that we're facing right now. So, to the, briefly to the second question, do we have enough money to respond to various crises? And again, the question is not entirely. And the proof that we don't have enough money to respond to every crisis that is coming is that we're constantly constructing new out-of-budget instruments in order to respond to crises and needs that occur. It's a whole galaxy of such out-of-budget instruments. And the brightest star in this galaxy right now is the next generation EU that you probably already have heard about and you will hear more a bit later. So these out-of-budget instruments uh, cannot really substitute what the EU budget can provide. And that's why it is important to have sufficient resources within the EU budget. Also, how we design this EU budget is important. Once Commissioner Hahn had estimated that there is only 1% of the EU budget money that could be spent flexibly and is not pre-allocated. So you can understand that even if it's a big pot of money, if we have only 1% that is in our hands to respond to crisis, this is not entirely enough. But still, coming back to the how large the pot is. Back in 1988, when some of you in the room were not even born then, 
back in 1998 was the last time when the own resources system of the EU budget was reformed. Own resources are the revenues, the, the money that are coming inside the EU budget. Right now, we are undergoing another big reform of the own resources issue, uh, system. And it is very important to look carefully in 2023 if this reform will be going up to speed, because it's already delayed a bit. And if it's not performed properly, the Commission should propose a second package of own resources and the Parliament, Council and Commission need to agree on the first already proposed package and on the second package. If they don't do that, we're going to have not only problem with res to respond to crises that are happening, but also to fund uh, the current programs that are going on. Thank you. So let's move uh, now to a uh, second sort of cluster of subjects with uh, two colleagues, with uh, Marin and Martin, and we are going to look at Next Generation EU that is also linked to financing, that is a special instrument that was created as a response to the COVID crisis. And I'd like to turn immediately to Marin, who is a member of our Next Generation EU Monitoring Service in the EPRS, and you are also affiliated researcher at the Ghent University. Um, what have we learned of the implementation of uh, NGU? Thank you very much, Etienne. Um, I would start by saying that uh, the EU recovery instrument, or next generation EU as we know it, has been an adequate and also timely uh, tool to address uh, the pandemic, but also means to keep investing, which is crucial. Um, the, the implementation of the facility is uh, going well. The instrument is delivering. Uh, we have milestones and targets which are being fulfilled. We have resources to the member states in the form of loans and grants that are being distributed. And also we have already uh, the required green and digital threshold um, exceeded. Um, the most important lesson, however, is the fact that uh, there is a unique combination of uh, substantial financial support from the EU uh, and the implementation of the, of the measures in the, in the member states. And these measures address key challenges of both European and domestic nature. Um, uh, this support has also helped in reducing the public investment gap, uh, which has been present in the EU for quite some time, according to certain analysis. So the concrete figures you can all see in our publication, which has just uh, uh, been published. Uh, but what I can say for the moment that uh, the facility is delivering. So, but, so we didn't close the door to public investment uh, after the COVID crisis. Uh, but what is next? What is going to happen now in 2023? So basically, uh, all eyes will be set on the implementation efforts in the in the member states. Uh, the, the planned investments and reforms need to be implemented swiftly um, in order to address the structural challenges that the member states are facing. Uh, but at the same time, we already have new challenges. Uh, we have in particular the energy crisis, uh, which was triggered by Russia's uh, aggressions. We heard about it uh, a few minutes ago. And also the ongoing climate crisis, uh, which is becoming more acute uh, by the minute. Um, on energy, specifically, uh, the private and public investment needs of the EU energy sector as a whole are estimated to be around 400 billion, which is a lot of money. And uh, this is per year and in a mid to long run. Uh, on the climate side, on the other hand, we have actions that are costly and require long implementation periods. Uh, so with these two facts in mind, uh, there is a tangible concern that a facility as such won't be sufficient to cover all these uh, challenges and also it's um, a relatively short life lifespan is uh, not apt to do so neither because the facility is set to expire by the end of 2026 so and, and can we remedy to this situation well, there is a couple of things that one can do, of course. Uh, so we know that the investment needs will remain great in the years to come. Uh, that is certain. And many analysts have um, stressed that keeping the investment in the EU alive is crucial. Uh, and I completely agree when it comes to that. Um, it is important to free up the already limited fiscal space that the member states are currently facing. And uh, this can be done by continuing providing uh, financial support from the EU level. Um, <clears throat> I would say this can 
can be done by maintaining the facility model so we could have a facility uh, 2.0 say it like this uh, but then this facility should be made permanent and bigger in resources of course um, in addition to this at the end uh, the forthcoming revision of the economic governance framework <clears throat> We should also facilitate uh, the investment efforts in the member states. Uh, in a, basically, if, if we have a good design of the EU fiscal rules, then this would allow for the member states to pursue higher investment and growth paths while staying fiscally prudent. Uh, in a nutshell, if you ask me, I would say the two are needed. We need to have a permanent fiscal capacity for the EU and also accompanying investment-friendly fiscal rules. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to stay now uh, in the sort of cluster uh, of investment and public investment and to look at the particular role of uh, our uh, central bank. And I'd like to ask Martin to present briefly his um, um, research on the Janus phased fiscal monetary mix. Um, we have heard from Marin that it's important to keep public investment in the EU alive and uh, to have a solid framework for that supports it. But the flip side of this coin is monetary policy, and that's your field of expertise in our economic policy unit. So how did fiscal monetary policy have fared so far? Yeah, I'm glad for once I can give you a positive answer to a question. Uh, indeed, the fiscal and monetary policy mix fared very well initially. The European economy fared uh, well and recovered strongly after the COVID-19 pandemic. Already some 15 months after the coronavirus hit, uh, European production was back to pre-crisis level and the economic momentum was firmly supported by fiscal and monetary policies uh, aligned in their goal to support the recovery. Uh, unfortunately, the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine has drastically changed those dynamics. Now, fiscal and monetary policy objectives face significant trade-offs and uh, between uh, on one hand uh, fighting inflation and on the other hand to support the economic recovery. In my publication I use a metaphor, the Roman deity Janus. Uh, Janus um, has two faces and he's looking in opposite direction with sharply contrasting characteristics. And just like him, fiscal and monetary policy objectives increasingly face in opposite directions. So unlike in, in the COVID crisis, there is now an increasing discrepancy between, on the one hand, fiscal uh, uh, policy and monetary policy objectives. So how could that happen? Yeah, let me use Janus again to explain that. So we have one phase, uh, fiscal policies, where governments are trying to cushion the impact of high energy prices. And such fiscal policies, if they are not targeted enough, meaning not focused on the most vulnerable households and companies, they tend to prop up demand, for instance, for energy consumption. With the other phase, uh, monetary policy, uh, central banks are fighting record high inflation rates. The European Central Bank already uh, increased policy rates four times in an unprecedented pace. And in that way, they are trying to dampen demand. So if we put both phases together, we have one phase looking to support the economy and therefore somehow maintain demand. And the other phase is focused on taming inflation and therefore trying to dampen demand. So what, what you're telling us, in other words, is that uh, Janus is going to continue to look in these two directions. Uh, well, so far he does, but um, on the upside, uh, the, the original goal, the, the single goal they have in common is to, to protect purchasing power from a monetary policy perspective uh, through ensuring price stability and from a fiscal policy perspective through cushioning the impact of the energy price shock. Now, the question is, how can uh, governments and central banks realign their policy objectives and their perspective uh, in 2023. And this is one topic to look out for in 2023. Thank you very much, Marin and Martin. So. <laughs> Let's uh, move back uh, here on stage and uh, look now at the impact on some of the internal policies uh, of the European Union, uh, sectoral policy, we could say. And I'd like to 
ask Monica Kish to present briefly a research on how will increased fuel prices impact transport. Monica is a policy analyst in the Structural Policies Unit and she examined what consequences increased fuel prices will have on the transport sector. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Etienne, and good afternoon. This morning, I went to the gas station. It was raining, and I had a look at the fuel prices. Diesel, 1 euro 77. Euro Super 95, 1 euro 74. Despite the fluctuations during the past months, it is still 20% higher than two years ago. We all know the causes of this increase, the war on Ukraine and the uncertainties that followed, the sanctions that the EU had to apply, for instance, the ban on Russian crude oil imports. But what will be the consequences on the transport sector of this increase? As most transportation modes rely on petroleum products, consequences will affect different dimensions in transport. It will come, firstly, to uh, shifts in transport usage. Passengers might change their habits, for example, by abandoning, postponing, or combining their trips. Transport providers might decrease service frequency. Secondly, it can come to model shifts, for instance, the aviation suffered very much from increasing jet fuel prices during the first half of 2022. This and the already low benefit margins will lead to disruptions and passengers and companies can turn towards other transport modes such as maritime or rail. Thirdly, commuting patterns can change. It can come to more ride sharing, carpooling, more use of public transport, or greener transport alternatives, such as cycling. But not only transport itself will be impacted, but also a series of related domains. Transport companies will be confronted with the question to work at a loss or to increase their prices to compensate. But this will lead to higher transport costs, and higher transport costs can lead to higher price of end products, and to further inflation. Higher transport costs can also be an additional burden for households and lead to transport poverty. In both passenger and freight transport, it can come to more strikes of transport workers, of transport providers, and this can lead to further disruptions. But can these increasing fuel prices be seen only as a challenge or maybe also as an opportunity, as something that can help us to a faster transition towards greener transport modes or something that can help us to use more renewable energy or something that can help us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Even if we have to leave some time for technical adaptations, in the long run, these increasing fuel prices might even help us to reach emission, emission targets faster than originally planned. File to follow in 2023. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I think you explained very well how much this war has consequences on the everyday life of people. You mentioned energy, you mentioned climate targets and so on. That brings me neatly to the next topic, which is uh, going to be introduced by Gregor Erbach, who is the head of our climate change action and tracking service. And Gregor is looking, uh, going to look at a particular issue, which is uh, the climate and socio-economic tipping points. And I'd like to ask you, Gregor, to explain what is a tipping point uh, and also why it does matter. Over to you, Gregor. A tipping point, it's a critical point in a situation beyond which significant and often unstoppable effect or change happens. An example of a climate-related tipping point is the Greenland ice sheet. Its stability depends on its height, which reaches up to 3,200 meters. And um, 
that helps maintain the eternal snow on top of the ice sheet. And once it starts losing that height, it starts melting and may enter an irreversible decline. And in Europe, this would have effects through um, rising sea levels. Tipping points can also have cascading effects, for example, droughts leading to desertification, food insecurity, and migration. And they may also be self-reinforcing, as in the case of when Arctic permafrost melts, and that will, through global warming, that will release methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, which in turn causes even more global warming. Now I'll just summarize the, what the research tells us on tipping points. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change identified 15 potential tipping points. A new research has shown that some of those are closer than previously thought. Seven are likely with uh, just 1.5 degrees of global warming, and five may already have been reached today. <coughs> These include the Greenland ice sheet and the permafrost. So, the targets of the Paris Agreement to limit global warming to 1.5 up to 2 degrees, they're not safe levels. And moreover, we're not even on a course for staying below 2 degrees. If all countries meet their national targets under the Paris Agreement, we can expect global warming of around 2.4 degrees. 1.5 degrees is still theoretically possible, but would require huge and radical changes that appear rather unlikely after the sobering outcome of the COP27 climate conference last year. Does that mean we should now give up on the 1.5 degrees and aim for staying below 2 degrees? The answer here is a clear no, because every fraction of a degree can make a difference of reaching a tipping point or not. So it remains important to limit global warming as much as possible, well below two degrees, as the parent agreement says. What needs to be done, first of all, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, of course, as the EU does with the climate law and the Fit for 55 package. Large-scale removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is another key element in which the parliament will be um, very much engaged this year. Risk assessment, early warning, preparation and adaptation are needed, supported by additional research to help um, take the right decisions here. Climate diplomacy, partnerships and trade policies are needed to ensure that others follow the lead of the EU to reach the climate neutrality by mid-century and avoid the worst consequences. Let me conclude with a remark about positive tipping points. It, it appears that the car industry has by now reached a tipping point away from fossil-powered vehicles towards electric ones, and that is enabled by falling battery prices, public opinion and policy support. There's promising research on policy interventions to enable a cascade of positive changes towards a deep and rapid transformation of technology, economy and society. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gregor, for packing such a, a complex subject in uh, in in a few minutes. Uh, I'd like now to to move um, back to what Anna said at the end of her presentation. She said she questioned if uh, Russia is going to be a failed empire, and I'd like to ask Angelos to look at the wider picture of uh, geoeconomics and. Um, ask him what are the consequences for the wider world, how you see it, and in particular, a territory that has been um, uh, sort of disputed by these, um, these powers is Africa, and to look at it. Angelo is uh, working in the External Policies Unit in the uh, Members Research Service. Over to you, Angelo. Thank you, Etienne. Uh, many of you may have looked at the uh, red newspapers during 2022 and may have uh, encountered Africa in several titles, in some of which, uh, for example, you may have seen that Africa contributes less than 5% in global <coughs> carbon emissions, yet is impacted disproportionately from climate change. In some others, that there are some low-income countries in Africa 
of which the sovereign debt has increases, increased with the COVID pandemic and which might face difficulties coming, going forward. In another one, <clears throat> the uh, issue with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the fact that some of those countries in Africa are dependent on Russian and Ukrainian grains and uh, the food security issue that this entailed. On top of all that, we must remember that Africa is a continent. It's a, the second largest and the second most populated continent on, in the world. We're talking about 54 states that represent more than 1.3 billion people. That's a lot of votes in the UN. That's huge markets for economists and uh, companies. It is a lot of things. So in the last 30 years, in the context of globalization and international, reinforcing international relations, many countries, including middle powers such as Turkey or superpowers such as Russia or China, have in strengthened ties with, uh, with African <coughs> countries. They did so for a multitude of reasons. They did so primarily for economic reasons, given its economics we're talking about, but also for political reasons, also for ideological reasons, uh, to promote a particular worldview, also for religious reasons, to promote themselves as a, a particular uh, strength, a particular pole of strength in the region. So we, in the contribution that we have created, <laughs> In my contribution, we have uh, singled out Russia, China, and Turkey because they are two superpowers and one emerging middle power, and because we wanted to show which things are they share, which reasons they share, and which means they share, and where they diverge. For example, all of them share, as I explained before, the fact that they focused on uh, investment and trade. All of them share that they saw Africa as a main market because they have a lot of resources. Almost one third of mineral resources of the world are there. We're talking about 10% almost of gas and oil. So those were primary reasons. But also, for example, Turkey saw Africa as a means to promote uh, the, uh, its, uh, its position as a religious uh, center, let's say as an Islamic religious center, middle power. Uh, Russia found a way to uh, develop militarily uh, and through its navy, air force, through private security companies such as Wagner uh, to uh, contribute and sell weapons and sell training in the continent. China to create, uh, we have seen thousands, I mean okay, hundreds of projects in the continent to increase strength, to create, to get, to obtain the necessary resources for its industries and to create necessary uh, new markets. Now, as I said, this has been an ongoing movement, thankfully peaceful, over the last 30 years. But while in the first 20 years this has been, uh, let's say, growing towards a unipolar world, let's say, in the last decade we see a change. We see the emergence of a, a great power rivalry. We see something that some have uh, dubbed a new age of empires. And in particular regions like Africa, like Central Asia, or like Latin America, new great games, what we have, they have been dubbed. So in that context, the uh, European Union, of course, positions itself through its member states and their various uh, uh, initiatives, but also as the European Union through financing instruments. Uh, for example, the Global Gateway, the, the, which runs from 221 to 227, and half of which has been pledged to Africa. We're talking about 150 billion in a seven-year period. That should uh, contribute to reducing the investment gap in the continent. Going forward, why did we pick this as uh, uh, ten, one of the 10 issues to watch in 2023? Because we're at a deflection point uh, in which uh, all those superpowers or powers um, are undergoing significant changes and might change the relation with regards to ties with Africa. China, on one hand, has emerged stronger after the third Communist Party plenum, with the third, uh, with Xi Jinping being reelected <coughs> for the third time, but at the same time is undergoing an economic crisis, which might have particular consequences. The same applies for Turkey. It's undergoing a significant economic crisis and during the 2023 is going to go through elections, which means that there might be a change in its policy. As for Russia, as was already mentioned by my colleague, it has, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the international reply to that, the sanctions and the other measures that were taken, its economy has been impacted, which also means that there might be a significant change in its policy with regards to Africa in the next few years. 
What will the EU do? How will the EU position itself? Personally, I think that it's a crucial point and we have a great opportunity to get closer ties with Africa through the Global Gateway. Some have said that, in fact, the Global Gateway is old wine and new bottles. So others have said that actually it holds a significant promise and they also said that we could merge it and use it with the uh, European Green Deal in order to uh, increase both the efficiency of those two financing instruments. The future will hold, we remain hopeful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angelos. Before moving to the next item, I'd just like to uh, remind that uh, Slido is open for questions and comments. So for, of course, those in the room can raise their hand when the time comes. But for those who are online, they can use this facility to put already their question and comments. I'd like to move now to the next topic, which is cyber resilience in the EU. Uh, Angelos just told us about conflicts, different from conflicts and influence, and how much the cyber dimension is going prominent. And Polonaka is a member of our Digital Policies Unit. She has just published a briefing on Cyber Resilience Act proposal. The Act deals with cybersecurity obligations of digital products before they are placed on the market. But products are just a part of uh, the information and communication technology supply chain. So, Polona, can you explain uh, what else is at stake and how the EU is approaching the issue to increase its cyber resilience? Over to you, Polona. Thank you, Etienne. Just two months ago, European Parliament voted on a resolution to recognize Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. And just hours after the vote, the Europol website was flooded by external network traffic to make it inaccessible. The website suffered a distributed denial of service attack. A pro-Kremlin group claimed responsibility. This recent example is a reminder that cyber attacks are proliferating and we are exposed to them directly. Who hasn't been? Our health data, bank accounts, or even access to energies under threat. Russia's aggression against Ukraine increasingly plays a role in this changing threat environment. Russia's hybrid approach merges physical and cyber attacks. It demonstrated that disruption of essential services is a realistic threat for Europe, for example. Attack on the satellite communication provider just one hour before the Russia's attack on Ukraine had an effect on internet services and windmills across Europe. Russia is not alone, however, on the list of malicious actors. Ransomware is still the most frequent form of cyber threat in the EU. We can expect it to occur every two seconds by 2031 costing billions of euros annually. This makes cybercrime the, most, the biggest transfer of wealth worldwide. Of particular concern are increasing capabilities of malicious actors who are now using attacks against complete supply chains. You might have felt the effects of the recent attack against the city of Antwerp, or even been a victim of the attack against the hospitals in the suburbs of Paris in December. I hope not, but it might have been the case. To address these growing threats, we can expect several EU legislative and non-legislative proposals. They are aiming to protect the infrastructure, connected devices, and the whole information communication technology supply chain. This includes accelerated efforts in implementing the recently adopted legislation, as well as new proposals, such as the Cyber Resilience Act. Protecting the 5G infrastructure, establishing cooperation in cyber defense, establishing secure satellite co connectivity system are just a few examples of actions that will contribute to these efforts in 2023. 
Cutting-edge technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence and supercomputers will facilitate these efforts to create a protective shield uh, around, uh, against the cyber threats. To be able to counter the cyber criminals, we will need uh, established <coughs> cooperation mechanisms and fully implemented support structures to facilitate the flow of information and uh, to gain in efficiency. Skilled workforce will be essential. And addressing the shortage of uh, cybersecurity professionals will play a very important role in addressing these challenges in 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Polona. Let's move uh, Maria now to the bench for conversation on journalists. So when, when she took office, uh, President Metzola insisted on the importance of uh, protecting journalists in the European Union. And if we look at recent reports like uh, Reporters Sans Frontières, Reporters Without Borders, we see that there is a dramatic worsening of the situation of journalists. The number uh, of journalists arrested, murdered, uh, taken hostage or missing. So this is a really a big issue worldwide. Uh, what about the EU and the situation in the EU member states? So thank you very much for asking this very important question, Etienne. In fact, probably the first thing that I should point out is that the European Union continues to be amongst the safest places in the world for both journalists and the media. However, it is true that recent reports such as, for example, the 2022 Commission Rule of Law Report or the 2022 Media Pluralism Monitor point out at, uh, let's say, uh, an increase, a uh, 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 trend, let's say, a worsening trend in some areas that affect media freedom and pluralism. Just to give you some examples, for example, in the last year, we have seen an increase in, uh, an increase in some increase in attacks to the safety of journalists. And we have also seen an increase in a number of strategic lawsuits against public participation, the so-called slaps. But it's not only that. We have also seen in the latest years a growing tendency towards more concentration in the media sector in the EU. And we have also seen, just to give you another example, an increase in the influence of political and economical actors in the editorial decisions, in editorial decisions in the media, obviously. So we can ask ourselves why let's say, this situation is worrisome. And in fact, I would like to point out that it is worrisome, even if, even if it is not as it is the case in some, other, in some other parts of the world in the European Union, it is worrisome, as I'm trying to say, because in fact, um, media pluralism and uh, freedom are really linked, are prerequisites of democracy. There is no democracy there where we do not have pluralistic media that can inform the citizens, help them to make sound political choices and act as public watchdogs. So th thank you, Maria. I think you, you very much uh, set the picture of uh, how these negative trends are developing. So, but what can the EU institutions now do to counter these negative trends? What are our tools? Yeah, in fact, this is a very good question because indeed the EU institutions are currently working on several legislative proposals that, if adopted, as we expect in this year, in 2023, may modify the EU landscape for the media. And here I'm talking about the legislative proposal to adopt an anti slap directive. I'm also talking about the the proposal on targeting and transparency of political advertising. And I'm also talking about the proposal, which is very well known, I think, to adopt an European Media Freedom Act. Of course, I'm not going to go into the details of every one of these three proposals. 
If the audience wants to know more, they can go to our publication and read it. But I would like to point out to two elements that are common to all these proposals that seem to be very important. The first one is that all of these proposals seek to strengthen the EU legal framework, seek to strengthen the EU legal framework for, for the media to try to achieve better media freedom and pluralism, enforce better media freedom and pluralism, protect better media freedom and pluralism, and therefore tend to uh, tend to move towards an EU media policy that is more focused on fundamental rights and, if you want, less preoccupied for the well-functioning of the internal market. And, second element, they want to do it just before the 2024 European elections, thus making this link, as I was pointing out before, between media, media freedom and pluralism and a vibrant democracy. So, if you allow me to conclude very quickly, I think these three legislative uh, processes are, are something to look at during this pre-electoral year. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Thank you also for, for referring to uh, the publication of the 10 issues to watch, but also the other publications and tools like the three pieces of legislation, le legislation that you mentioned. They can be tracked in our legislative train schedule website that is a database on legislation. Thank you. Let's move to the last topic now on the European elections. So, uh, as I said, uh, the European election will take place next year. It's less than 18 months. It's, in fact, uh, 15 months. Uh, in his introduction, Vice President Karas insisted on the importance of trust between institutions and citizens and trust in European institutions in particular. So there is a lot at stake before these elections, uh, the role of uh, European political parties, the process of the Spitzenkandidat and so on. And I'd like to ask Silvia Kotanidis, who is our constitutional expert, special, specialist on elections in our citizens policy unit to present our paper that will be the last of these uh, presentations of the 10 issues to watch today. Over to you, Silvia. Thank you, Etienne. Um, perhaps, um, some of you may ask, uh, isn't it too premature to think about elections? Uh, we don't seem to lack uh, issues to worry about. Uh, having heard the presentations before, increased costs uh, of transport, the war in Ukraine, inflation. Um, in fact, uh, I think that uh, for several reasons, 2023 will be a year to look at with certain attention. Um, there are, in fact, some challenges that uh, will have to be faced. Uh, some of them derive from recent investigations, uh, of which we all know about, and uh, uh, about which uh, President Karas, uh, Vice President Karas has talked about before. Some other uh, challenges derive from the very nature of uh, the European elections. Concerning the one deriving from recent events, one can say that they um, let's say, the engagement with which uh, the European institutions, particularly Parliament, will engage in um, reforms and discussions on transparency, on ethics, will have an impact on uh, the trust that will be rebuilt or restored or strengthened with the citizens so as to take them to the ballots. With respect to the nature of the European elections, here perhaps I share with you two brief questions. The first one is how will be the electoral uh, campaign be run? In other words, will we have a Spitzenkandidaten process or not? In which case, how will it be? Which European uh, political parties will adhere to it? Um, we know that uh, we have run it already twice. Uh, the first time was in 2014 when it was a sort of called by someone um, a revolution uh, because uh, one of the lead candidates succeeded to be uh, elected as president of the European Commission. The second time in 2019 was considered the opposite, a sort of counter-revolution because none of the lead candidates made it and a complete outsider, President von der Leyen, was elected 
as President of the European uh, Commission. So the question is whether there will be at all a revolution next time. Um, we don't know it yet. European political parties have not decided yet. We have a very general agreement between the three SND, EPP and the Renew on uh, the fact that um, Spitzenkandidaten should be linked to transnational list, but we don't have nothing really concrete. Um, but political, European political parties will have to decide in 2023. So 2023 is relevant for that. Um, it will be uh, whatever will happen, uh, one can imagine that it will be rather surprising if uh, Parliament will renounce to such an influential role as to uh, influence the election of uh, one of the highest offices in the European Union without trying to fix what did not work in 2019. Um, the second question that perhaps I raise <laughs> with you here is uh, another one, is uh, concerns more the attitude with which uh, citizens and we or citizens will go to the ballots in the sense that we know that the Conference on the Future of Europe after one year has now produced uh, some very um, interesting forward-looking proposals. So the question is whether how these proposals will be implemented, whether this will have an impact on uh, the attitude with which we will go to the elections. So will there be a spillover effect of the Conference on the Future of Europe? And this will depend, of course, on how uh, the institutions will decide to implement those, uh, those proposals. Um, so perhaps I, by concluding on, uh, on a positive note, I'm also the last one of, uh, of the group here. So I would like to say that as we uh, saw an increase in the turnout uh, to the elections in 2019, um, Perhaps we can, um, we can hope that this uh, positive uh, trend will continue if there are some good reforms, some, uh, the Spitzenkandidaten, and if there are some uh, correct and efficient uh, implementation of the proposals of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. So this was the last uh, of the 10 issues to watch that are presented today. Again, I would like to refer to the publication for those who want to dig in in the one of the other subjects. Uh, now we are going to have a bit of time for question and answers or quick comments from the floor. I say quick comments because we have to finish the event at 15 hours because it's web stream, as you know, and uh, we are cut off at 15 hours. So therefore, we need to uh, we need to be disciplined and finish uh, on time. I will take uh, questions in and comments in groups of three. So. Um, either uh, on site uh, or online, and I will not uh, discriminate any uh, questions that are um, that are online. So, um, so please, if you have if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand. I'm a bit in it. Yes, the lady uh, first in the in the front. Yes, with the glasses. And if you could say yes. uh, briefly who you are. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, my name is Ksenia <coughs> Polska. I am a journalist at Deutsche Welle. And I mainly work for uh, Ukrainian, for the Ukrainian and Russian service, but also a little bit for Spanish. But um, this question goes mainly for the Eastern European services. And um, uh, you can hear a lot about Russia, Russia, Russia. In fact, I uh, briefly read through um, the whole trends and you can see a lot of mentioning of Russia throughout the all the papers almost. But um, I only saw Ukraine several times and mostly uh, war in Ukraine was mentioned. Um, so my my question is uh, for for the author of uh, of, the, of the Russian uh, paper. Um, Thank you for mentioning uh, also uh, your Ukrainian background. So here's the question. What are the scenarios for Ukraine to watch out for? Maybe in 2023 even. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. Is there another question that is uh, also about uh, uh, Russia or more external relations in general? I saw, uh, what was that? Sorry? Uh, yes, the lady in the in the front there on the right with the long hair. Yes, Elena. 
<laughs> it's you. I, sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you, Etienne. You were half, uh, half, half hidden. Yes, long hair gave it away. Uh, have, happy New Year to everyone and really big congratulations to the author and to the colleagues who have organized this event. Uh, it's always very good. This year it's, I think, exceptional and the link between the topics. And I uh, also have a question to Anna. Um, it doesn't link up to, it does link up actually to the future of Ukraine because my question is, Anna, you, and we've talked about this before, you talked about a weaker Russia, but do you see a possibility of a, uh, fragmented and sort of dissolving Russian Federation and how would that perhaps link up to the way that citizens in Russia are perceiving the war and that the Russian opposition is managing to organize itself so thank you for that and I think the gentleman behind you uh, had, had also a question uh, so just hand over the, the microphone but not related to not on this one Russia. so but maybe we, we stay on Russia Ukraine if there is another one uh, quick comment yes please Yes. Yes, thank you very much. It's very interesting. Um, I have studied physics informatics. I am a member of the European Physical uh, Society. My question is, you make a lot of um, plans how happened in Russia and how Putin is going down. That it cannot be worse than Putin. It cannot be worse than Bucha and Izum and Mariupol. So uh, instead to make this plan, make a plan, how can you help the political opposant in, in Russia? Uh, they are Navalny now, you have a petition of a hundred of, med of medicine uh, who, who are saying to direct to Putin, then uh, his uh, healthy situation is very bad. How can the European Parliament help in this situation? That is my question. Okay. And, and how can you help that Ukrainian, uh, that the Ukrainian get more much uh, uh, arms and, and, and military, uh, technical, uh, um, uh, um, that they Thank need you. to Thank I think to, we understand the, the question. Thank you very yes. much. Anna, you want to, to comment on this? There was one like that? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, well, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I think, no. And um, thank you very much for the questions and for the interest in the, in the issue, which really touches my heart, as I understood, touches yours. Um, to the first question, the scenarios of Ukraine, you're right. Uh, we are mainly mentioning the Russian war uh, in the paper because the publication is uh, in this case, uh, mostly the issues to watch uh, that affect directly um, the European Union in, in the reverberations of the of the Russian war. Um, the, uh, um, we have published uh, a lot of uh, articles about uh, Ukraine, a lot of papers, and uh, I think that the, the the scenario for Ukraine is in a way, m more clear than the one for Russia. Um, the European Union has uh, granted uh, candidate status for Ukraine. That's a clear path. And, uh, of course, we cannot ensure how quickly and how easy will be the path, but there is a path, uh, which is not the case for, for, for Russia, if you want. Um, I would uh, invite you to contact our colleague uh, specialized in Ukraine, and I will gladly put you in contact with him. Um, for further discussion. Um, the second question was about uh, uh, the uh, one of the possible scenarios of Russia, uh, fragmentation. Uh, this is a scenario that I've been uh, seeing more and more in the in the media, and sometimes with a catastrophic um, uh, flavor, uh, even maps circulate with full of f different flags in the different regions of the Russian Federation. Um, I would not exclude something like that. Also because Russia is, well, it's not only the biggest country in the world, it's um, 146 million of habitants, but with 85 subjects in the Rus Russian Federation, 89 if we add the illegally annexed uh, regions, and um, more than 150 ethnic uh, groups 
or uh, nationalities as they are called in the in the federation so it has a lot of potential for uh, uh, partial fragmentation uh, the uh, mobilization has um, um, ignited a lot of uh, um, hater or a lot of discrimination uh, towards uh, uh, some of the regions which are all in the periphery of the Russian Federation, Buryatia, Kalmatia, etc., etc., are just one to, to, to mention, uh, because uh, representatives of those ethnic groups have been um, uh, disproportionately called for mobilization. It's not excluded, although I don't see it as an orderly uh, signature of a treaty between the subjects of the Federation. It will be more like a disgregation um, by feeling a vacuum of power. More, I see more or less like that. The last question from, do we have a little bit moment? Uh, the last question is, uh, I mentioned uh, Alexei Navalny in my speech and it was not supposed to be there. I mentioned because I read the, the letter by now 450 doctors. Um, I read the letter of the wife of Navalny. Um, the family of Navalny was in, the, in this parliament um, just a few months ago because Navalny is a Saharov laureate. And um, I am not sure what the European Union can do for that now, but I'm sure we are not going to remain silent. Um, our tools are limited, but I think Europe is demonstrating that it's able to put them at work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Uh, Thank you very much. Anna, we have, uh, I'd like to mention also that concerning Navalny, it will, he was awarded uh, the Sakharov Prize uh, the year before. Uh, now, Jesus, uh, on another uh, type of issue. And then I see we have also questions from uh, Slido coming afterwards, please. Thank you, Etienne, and well, congratulations uh, to all interveners here. Uh, it's been great uh, to, to listen to all of you. Changing of topic, I would like to move to the European elections in 2024. It's true, it's still far away, but we are <coughs> mainly interested in know how to increase the turnout again. And uh, well, I was listening to Silvia, thank you, on uh, the Spitzen candidate in question on the electoral reform, but shouldn't we focus more on delivery, on what uh, the European Union has been doing during this last five years to, to make uh, the life of citizens better? Uh, is the delivery question a topic that uh, we should be looking into this year, 2023 as well? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, uh, for, for this comment and suggestion. Uh, yes, uh, Madalena, and just behind you, Madalena, afterwards. First, Madalena. Thank you. Congratulations also from me. Uh, I have a question linked to, linked to uh, uh, Jesus uh, about transnational lists, um, how that develops uh, uh, and it c could it somehow be interesting aspect in the next elections, transnational lists? Thank you. Just behind you, Madalena, if you can hand over the mic. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about a different topic, actually, for Marine. Um, you briefly mentioned the, um, the per a permanent fiscal capacity for the EU. Could you elaborate more <coughs> on what it means and how it would be beneficial to the EU? Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have now uh, two questions that are linked that are really uh, dedicated to European election and delivery of the European Union and transnational list. Maybe, um, Sylvia, you can comment on this? Yes. Um, just, just speak. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you, Jesus, um, for your question. Um, I think uh, I could, uh, I don't know if safely say, but the European Union is, is sometimes is not the best advertiser of its own, uh, what it does. And uh, in that respect, I think it's true that uh, there is an issue of knowing what uh, Europe does, what has done in the last five years, but also in general, how it works and how um, it uh, fosters the, the interest of, uh, of, of the Union and, uh, and how it can be used for, 
for citizens. Uh, in that respect, Europe uh, and the Conference on the Future of Europe has highlighted that the delivering on that is relatively poor. A lot of citizens don't have an idea of how Europe works, of what it has done, of what it can do, and uh, what it cannot do either also. So in that respect, I think, yes, a big, a big reflection on uh, a better campaign, a better self, uh, um, how can I say, self-promotion um, uh, could be useful. On another point, I think uh, that the, 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 typically the electoral campaign, uh, it's always run on domestic issues. And how to unlock this problem is a big issue because at the end of the day, uh, very often in uh, European, European uh, election campaigns, we talk about uh, domestic issues and uh, we hardly know to which uh, European political party one domestic party adheres to. So that is another uh, point that uh, if uh, the previous reform that was adopted with decision 2018 had been already had entered into force, we would not have this, uh, this problem because on the ballot you would see to which, uh, to which European political party ad, uh, belongs a certain, a certain domestic party, uh, political party. So there are several things that one can do. For sure, communication is important, but also um, something else that uh, depends a bit on the maturity and of, of, of maturity of European political parties and the relation with domestic uh, parties. That is one point. On uh, uh, trans I don't know if I replied to, to your question. Um, uh, on the second point of, uh, of uh, Magdalena, yeah, uh, transnational list is, um, is something that comes up uh, almost uh, every legislature. And there have been umpteen uh, proposals on that. Now there is a very concrete one uh, that has been uh, uh, approved uh, by Parliament and it is now lying with the Council. We know that it's a very delicate issue. Uh, there is always the big division of those who want, those who don't want. This time we have a, a very concrete proposal, also nicely engineered so that there is a, a preservation of geographical uh, equilibrium, would say, because the bigger problem of transnational lists is that medium and small states fear that uh, uh, candidates coming from bigger states take take it all, so to say. This time there is a, a very thoughtful uh, reform and proposal. It is with the Council, so for sure, at least I can safely say, but it doesn't seem to be likely that it will come, uh, it will be adopted next, uh, for the next election, that is for sure. It will even contravene uh, the guidelines of uh, the Venice Commission whereby the um, substantial reforms to the electoral law should at least be enforced one year before the elections for reasons of transparency so that um, the electorate goes to vote knowing what are the new rules. So if this answers to your question is that indeed there is, uh, there is something on the table but it is still under discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. I'd just uh, like to add uh, to do a self, uh, bit of self-advertising that on the delivery of the EU uh, towards citizens, uh, the EPRS is having this website, What Europe Does For Me, that EU, uh, where you can find examples of uh, the impact of legislation on certain particular group of citizens, but also on territories uh, of the Union. And this website is now being updated and enriched and will be ready for the campaign classically. Uh, the last year before the election is also the year of legislation reaching their end. So now there are a lot of legislative proposals reaching final agreement. And then, of course, there are very important, very good stories to tell to the citizens. Uh, I stop here and I hand over to Marine. Uh, that is a question on the fiscal capacity. Thank you, Etienne, and uh, thank you for your question. Uh, when it comes to fiscal capacity or forming one, I'm very passionate. I do not hide, hide that like, uh, uh, at all, but we do not have much time to discuss that, like, yeah, I guess, in, in, the, in this setting. What I want to say like that we can always discuss the design and the size of the capacity, and those are dimensions per se very, very complex, uh, but what what I want to say when I, when I uh, talk about the permanent fiscal capacity is basically that it's a means to keep uh, public investment in the EU alive. This hasn't happened 
during the last crisis, the euro crisis, there were like many austerity measures in the member states, limited fiscal space, so the investment suffered. And um, basically, <clears throat> due to this, uh, a permanent fiscal capacity would alleviate those uh, stresses that the member states are facing. And uh, the good example is the COVID-19 crisis, because with a recovery and resilience facility, um, uh, the member states gained another influx of money in order like, to finance their expen expenditure and have decent projects or not so. Um, however, like we also like exited the, the, the pandemic crisis or some say that we exited it, but we, we, we are immediately, uh, fa we've been immediately faced with new crises, the energy crisis, the war in Ukraine, uh, and so on. And um, basically, uh, some say that uh, this is a state of a permanent crisis that the EU is facing. And then if we have a permanent crisis, a state of permanent crisis, I think it's only reasonable to have a permanent capacity to address these challenges. Thank you, thank you, Marine, for this uh, response. Now I see that there are some questions that are arriving on Slido. Uh, Isabel, if you can help us here. Uh, we have received um, three questions already by Slido. For those of you uh, online watching the event who want to ask questions, the Slido QR code was given at the very beginning, or you can find it in the email promoting the event. I know there was a last email sent still this morning. So, uh, first question by Stefano Spinacci, a colleague of ours, to Monica. Uh, in her presentation about increasing fuel prices, Monica Kish mentioned the concept of transport poverty. What is transport poverty? Could you explain this? There is also a question from an anonymous. Couldn't the EU countries set up some kind of budgetary provision that member states could redistribute to citizens in case of natural disasters linked to global warming? So cross-cutting questions. And another one to Polona. How would the Cyber Resilience Act contribute to protecting the EU citizens from cyber threats? This is what I have received so far on Slido. Thank you, Isabel. I think Polona, Grego, uh, Monica, Gregor, and Polona in that order, if they want to comment on the questions. First, uh, first uh, Monica, sorry, Monica. Uh, so transport poverty, it is indeed a very interesting question. Transport poverty is not a scientific term, but it is increasingly used in research papers and it has been also mentioned recently by the European Commission. It refers to a situation when high transport costs prevent individuals to get to work or to, to get to affordable uh, basic services, for instance, healthcare or education. And it can prevent them uh, completely to have these services or to get to work, or it can be a huge burden for them. Uh, in general, we speak about transport poverty when transport costs for a household exceed 10% uh, of the budget of this household. And uh, it is also important to mention that transport poverty um, uh, goes in line with other um, vulnerabilities, other social vulnerabilities. So for instance, elderly or uh, people already at the threshold of poverty are more exposed to transport poverty. And it has also a regional dimension. So rural areas or remote regions where transport uh, has a more important role are more exposed to this phenomenon. And I will hand over to Gregor. Okay, thank you. The question was if the EU could make available funds to um, people suffering from global warming or from... And I, the EU has funds for dealing with natural disasters that may result from global warming. Unfortunately, I'm not expert in the area, so I can't give you more details here. But I also want to mention <coughs> that the EU has funds to um, support populations that are affected by climate policies in the form of the Just Transition Fund to help regions transform their industries, to help workers um, requalify, and in form of the Social Climate Funds, which helps lower income households to deal with the costs from um, carbon pricing. 
thank you for the question. So for those who forgot, the question was how would the Cyber Resilience Act proposal um, help the consumers, how it would protect the consumers? Um, first of all, I would like to invite you to read uh, a lot of details about it in our legislative briefing that was published end of December. But in short, um, the proposal introduces mandatory requirements for manufacturers, uh, cybersecurity re requirements for a very, very broad range of products. So this includes software, hardware, and ciliary services which are uh, directly or indirectly connected to a network or a device. So it's really broad. It's a horizontal proposals, and it increases the responsibilities of manufacturers. It, they would need to inform the consumers about cybersecurity of proposals. They would need to um, also uh, provide software updates and patches throughout the life cycle of the, of the product. So in this respect, uh, the, the transparency would be much greater. Uh, it's, the proposal would oblige the manufacturers to, to report on any vulnerabilities. So really, it's a big step forward. Uh, so, and uh, in, the number of incidents are expected to decrease of, uh, because of uh, the proposal once, of course, it's adopted and implemented. So for consumers, it's definitely a, a big, 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 um, a positive development. Thank you, Polona. Alina, you wanted to add something on the question about uh, financing the mitigation of climate change. Yes, uh, very shortly, just to say that in the EU budget, it's planned to create a new um, social climate fund, which is also addressing the issues, uh, the social issues that are caused by the climate changes. But again, we are coming to the question that in order to create new funds and new responses to new needs and crises, we need also new resources to come in the budget. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. With this, we are reaching the end of the allocated time. I'd like to thank, first of all, the authors. Uh, it has been a great moment uh, of presentation. I would like to encourage the audience uh, for the ones that don't have uh, read it yet to take the 10 issues to watch and to take the time to, to read them. I would like also to, to thank in particular the ones that have made it possible behind the scene, in particular Isabel Godel, that every year prepares this event very professionally and effectively. Uh, thank Anne-Cécile Charlier that is taking care of the organization of the event uh, online. Of course, Lea and the media team, uh, I would like to encourage you also to watch the small videos that are done on each of the 10 issues by the authors. And finally, again, a big thank you to the authors. On, on, the, 20, on the 25th of January, we will have in this uh, library reading room, Water Wolf, to present his book on uh, financing democracy, how European uh, political parties are financed. And that builds up a very interesting link with uh, what Sylvia was presenting before. So I encourage you to come or to watch us online. And early February, we will have also the presentation of our economic and budgetary outlook. And many of the issues that we raised or we touched upon today will be further developed in this economic and budgetary out outlook. Many thanks to all of you. Uh, have an excellent day and see you soon. Bye-bye.